Hello there. This week we'll be looking at Scott Barrett's double yellow card. Uh, we'll be casting with eye over France, Australia. So a lot to come on Whistle Watch. Right then, let's start with South Africa, New Zealand in Twickenham. And it was New Zealand's biggest loss ever. How many of you saw that result coming? I certainly didn't. And the double yellow card for Scott Barrett. So what we have, first of all, we have Quite a few penalties given away by New Zealand. I think around seven in total. So the referee now has probably said, look, there's a lot of penalties here. If it continues, it's going to be a yellow card. Hence, we have a yellow card of Scott Barrett because of the amount of penalties. Then what we have is another offence by Barrett where he goes in off his feet with the shoulder, cleaning out in the contact area. Now, he's very, very lucky that he doesn't make contact direct with the neck or the head. Because if so, then the referee would have probably given a straight red. But because the contact was away from the neck and the head and the referee felt that the degree of danger was low, which means that it's now a yellow card offence, we then have a double yellow card. And of course, two yellow cards means a red. Another result in the weekend that a lot of people didn't see coming. Well, maybe some of you did see it coming, actually. It was Fiji's first ever win against England. Congratulations to them. And even more so, the win took place in Twickenham as well. Now, some of you have been asking why Joe Mahler was not yellow carded or even maybe red carded for his tackle in that game. Well, what we have here is no clear evidence that there was contact or an illegal contact with the head of the neck area. So the TMO and the referee, they can only look at all the angles that's available. And so if they don't have any angles to show that there was contact to the head or the neck, then we don't have foul play and we don't have then a sanction to fall on. Just remember, we keep saying that we want players to get the tackles lower. But if you do make an upright tackle, but there is no illegality, there's no contact with the head or the neck, or it's not above the shoulders, within the laws of the game, that type of tackle is not illegal. But I also must stress, we want the players to get those tackles lower just in case they get it wrong and they do land up with a sanction or an injury to the player. But on this occasion, no evidence whatsoever to show that Mahler did make illegal contact with the head or the neck. And that's why there was no sanction. Let's get over to France where they secured their commencing win over Australia in the end. Now, a little bit of confusion some of you noticed with the assistant referee in the side. Was the ball kicked directly out? Was it direct? Was it in? Did he kick outside the 22? Was he in the 22? Well, this is the law. So, when a player has the ball, and his foot is on the line, whether that be the goal line, the trial line, the touch line, or the 22 meter line, he is deemed to be in. Which means if you have one foot on the 22 meter line, even though the ball on your other foot may be outside of it, you are deemed to be in the 22 meter line. So quite correctly here, the outcome is the correct one, which is a gaining ground because that foot was on or in and in goal. And that's it for Whistle Watch this week. A pretty straightforward one for a change. Now let's look at your Emirates fans' questions. Okay, now then, my favourite part of Whistle Watch is your Emirates fans' questions. So let's have a look at them. In the Ireland Samoa match, Wayne Barnes told off an Ireland player for shouting at him on two occasions. What sanction can a referee impose for repeated offences like this? Now there are various. Uh, sanctions that the referee can apply or non-sanction just by communication and management. Wayne Barnes is one of the best in communicating. So sometimes when a player shouts or says something, you'll have a quiet word and say, hey, excuse me, I'm the referee on this field, not you. Uh, or if you feel that his actions warranted a penalty, then you could penalise him. If you felt what he shouted warranted a yellow card, uh, you could wear a card in. But if you felt that his actions, what he shouted at you or an opponent or was being abusive, then you could give a red card. Wayne will have the feel of the game and with us on this occasion would feel that the appropriate sanction would be a word, a quiet word or a stern word to that player. Hi Nigel, my wife and I love watching Whistle Watch. Well, thank you very much to you. Uh, if you could have refereed any Wales's games, what game from the past do you wish you could have been part of? Well, now then, 
I'm not sure if you do know this, but I did actually referee uh, back in November 2019. I refereed Wales against the Barbarians in Cardiff. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. But if I had to choose a game to referee Wales, you know what? I think I'd like to go back to referee some of those great sides and great games of the 70s to referee the likes of Gareth Edwards, Barry John, Gerald Davis, Phil Bennett, some of the greatest that the game has ever seen. Tries for Smith versus Fiji, Vinarulo versus France. How is the offside line defined in open play kicks and do other attacking players need to be entirely behind it or just part of the body behind or level with it? Good question. Now, <clears throat> you are offside in open play if you are in front of a teammate who has the ball, who last played the ball. To answer your question, if I am in line, so my foot is in line or behind the player who last played or kicked the ball, then I'm deemed to be onside. Remember my question and my answer to you earlier on your question on whistle watch uh, with the foot on the 22 meter line. So even though my foot is on the 22 meter line, but I'm all in front of it, it means I'm still on or in the 22. Same applies here. As long as part of my body is on or behind the player who last played the ball, uh, then I am deemed to be onside. A little bit complicated that offside line in open play. So I hope that helped your understanding of it. And that's it for our MRS fans question this week. I'll be back soon to answer more of them. So keep them coming. Now, are you all excited? Rugby World Cup begins next week. So all the teams and the players and the officials will have made their way to France. And what have I decided to do? I've decided to pick out a player from each country, 20 countries, so there'll be 20 players that I think may star in this World Cup. Now, we obviously know that the likes of Dupont, Trissamit, uh, Sevilla, and many other players are gonna stand out as some of the greatest players uh, in the tournament. But I've picked out a few here that may not be on your checklist, but certainly ones worth looking out for. So let's start with the first one, which is Des Sathia from Namibia. At number two, Agustin Crevy, Argentina. Very experienced and may play a hugely influential part in Argentina's success in this World Cup. Diego Arbelo from Uruguay. Adam Coleman, Tonga. Will Skelton, old big Will Skelton from Australia. He's going to be a big presence for Australia, that's for sure. Mihai Makovi from Romania. And then we have the Wales captain, uh, Jack Morgan, one of the players that certainly is on form going into the World Cup. Becca Gordaze from Georgia. Danny Kerr from England, very experienced, getting on a bit, but still as sharp as ever, so keep an eye out for him. Rodrigo Fernandez from Chile, very skillful player for Chile, and I'm pretty sure that he may have a few tricks up his sleeves during the World Cup. Cannon Moody, South Africa. Jordi Barrett, New Zealand. Thomas Appleton, Portugal. Darcy Graham, Scotland. Now reminds me of a bit like the old Shane Williams. Well, he's old now, but he wasn't old when he was playing. And what about Capuzzo from Italy? We all remember as Welsh players how we won that game in the final minutes against Wales in Cardiff in the Six Nations from two years ago. I wonder if he'll do something similar again. Theo McFarland from Samoa. Josh van der Fleer, World Rugby Player of the Year and is going to be an integral part of Ireland's success in this World Cup. Matthew Gilbert from France, hugely talented. I remember refing his first cup for France, unfortunately in that game, as he always reminds me, he broke his leg. Um, but great to see him back on top form and he's certainly going to be one that may well light up the World Cup out in France. Kotaro Matushima from Japan. Always exciting when you watch Japan play and he certainly is one to watch as well. And Vania Habosi from Fiji. So there you are. Those are the ones that I picked out that play a very exciting part in hopefully what will be a hugely successful and exciting World Cup. That's it. The next time you see me, we'll be reviewing the first weekend of the Rugby World Cup. A viento. That, I am told, is see you soon in French. Or if it's in Welsh, we'll let you come here. See you soon. Bye bye.